53 years ago, you had to climb the world's tallest mountain to become a famous New Zealander. Nowadays, all you have to do is subject yourself to an enema on a reality TV program or simply dress like a whore. There's no doubt our definition of fame has changed. These days, social climbers are just as famous as mountain climbers, and the peaks they scale can be just as heady. When Hillary climbed Everest, he entered the history books. But when 29-year-old Aucklander Robin Reynolds climbed Robbie Williams, she entered the women's magazines, reaching a far bigger audience than poor old Sir Ed. Uh, what do I look for in a girl? I don't know, I'm still looking. I haven't found the one I'm after yet, or what she does. Or, uh, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe you've got blonde hair, black roots. The blonde model-slash-grooming consultant met Williams when he toured here, and after seducing the pop singer, she went straight to the press to crow about her achievements. Reynolds is just one in a long line of Kiwi star fuckers who, like vampiric infants, have supped at the breast of international celebrity. Hello, Robin speaking. But not everyone was so tacky when it came to fondling the famous. In 1987, an unknown waitress slash model became an instant star after this spectacular tongue wrestle with pop star David Bowie. Do we believe everything we read in the gossip columns about you and David Bowie? Yes. I denied it for a long time, but yes. <laughs> I don't know, I think... Um, Maybe David always sort of has a little bit of a fling with his leading ladies or something, you know. I mean, he's an incredibly um, attractive person, you know, not only physically, but he's also really intelligent and he's just such a nice guy. We sort of had a little bit of an affair when we were shooting the China Girl video. And then when we finished shooting that, about a month after that, he was on tour doing the um, Serious Moonlight tour. And he phoned me up and said, um, I'm in Paris, no, I'm in London. I'm going to Paris next week. Do you want to come along? And so, I, of course, he said yes. <laughs> Ji Ling's fame continued long after the affair was over. She even scored a plum roll on the silly, soapy, sexy shoulder pad saga, Gloss. Who walks around with sugar bags over their heads tied up with string? She's not wearing a sugar bag. She's wearing a hat. If you're going to continue to undermine my work as fashion editor, I wish you'd let me know so I can make other arrangements with my professional life. Well, don't be a bore, Jasmine. You're so pretty, it'd be a shame to lose you. Don't patronise me. But luckily, Ji Ling didn't give up her day job, and she now runs a highly successful tavern. Over the years, many Kiwis have fondled or even copulated their way into the hearts and wet spots of famous foreigners. A cheeky romance once blossomed between the dusky diplomat Kofi Annan and one of our leading political ladies. Was it this one? Or this one? Oh no, that's right, it was the green beauty and Easter egg activist Sue Kedgley. And there was royal rooting, most notably when Princess Anne's hubby Captain Mark Phillips indulged in some after-hours dressage with local lass Heather Tonkin. The British newspaper Ms Tonkin has sold her story to has begun publishing excerpts. I asked him how I would find his room. He said not to worry, his riding boots would be outside his door. Lots of women, men, have tried to star fuck me. But I've said no, no, I'm, I'm keeping myself pure. Because when I meet the right star fucker, then, then I'll give myself 100%. Tantalising Thames temptress Kylie Bax was known to step out with Donald Trump. But she denied graduating from romantic apprentice to fully qualified fuck buddy. You've been photographed recently with Donald Trump. It's been in a lot of the magazines. Are you guys an item? Don and I have great fun with that. <laughs> Regardless of whether the pair consummated their relationship, Donald was given a great honour here in New Zealand when this guinea pig was named after him. This guy here, we've um, named Donald uh, after Donald Trump because he's got 
quite a nice comb over going on there and um, he stands out quite a bit with it. He's got by far the best comb over of all of them. So, um, and he is the boss as well. To this day, Donald is our most famous guinea pig. But our most notable beast is not a rodent. It's a bloody big horse. Farlap was born in New Zealand, but like Russell Crowe, he couldn't wait to escape to Australia. He was a remarkable horse, but alas, not immortal. The remains of the great beast are kept in a highly sterile facility at the famous Melbourne Equine Museum in St Kilda. This is Farlap's heart. The fleshy powerhouse of the champion is now stored here at this high security. Though not native to New Zealand, we also had a very famous bear. And although many prominent New Zealanders thought that Cookie Bear was real, he was merely a man in a costume. And a very human man at that. Bob Morris was the man behind the mask. An experienced Shakespearean actor who fell on hard times until he was discovered by a Hudson's talent scout. The Cookie Bear was an instant hit. He quickly became an Antipodean megastar and almost an international one too. In 1976, a certain George Lucas offered the bear a major role in his sci-fi epic Empire at War, the project that would later become Star Wars. Cookie Bear was cast as a sidekick to Harrison Ford's Han Solo. Uh, George was on holiday in Queenstown when he first saw Cookie on television. He felt that he had a real sense of danger. It was something that he was looking for. And he knew he was going to appeal to the kids. So George basically created the role for him. But after just two weeks of shooting, it was clear that the bear would have to go. Like many New Zealanders, Morris was unprepared for the temptations of Hollywood. The availability of hardcore drugs was a honeypot that the cookie bear just couldn't resist. Yeah, he, he was often found really high on set to the point where he couldn't go on. You know, this for George was really difficult because he felt like he had the right man for the role. And then, of course, the incident with Sir Alec. When Cookie Bear exposed himself to Alec Guinness in the middle of a scene, it was the final straw. And the film's producers had no choice to sack the wayward bear. Morris was replaced by his understudy, and Cookie became Wookie. Cookie Bear was to make only one other film, and it was to be his last. While on location in the Canadian Rockies, Cookie Bear was mistaken for a real bear and shot to death by hunters. Back after rubbing shoulders with the famous Miss Universe 1983, Lorraine Downs was invited along to the market to press her hands into its celebrity walk, Hollywood style. Like Hollywood, Auckland has its own tribute to celebrity. She's the second famous New Zealander to make such an impression. Two days before the general election, Sir Robert Muldoon launched the walk with his handprints. Of the 33 individuals commemorated here at Victoria Park Market's famous celebrity walk, one is a spokesperson for erectile dysfunction, one lost a testicle, one was shot by bandits, another is currently doing time, and at least two are lesbians. It's a reminder that fame for all its rewards can be a double-edged sword. There was only one Kiwi to have his name removed from the Walk of Fame, and his name might surprise you. The Milky Bar Kid was the most famous white in the country, but one night his addiction to sugary confections turned to tragedy. The kid was a guest on the home show, and everything seemed to be going well until this happened. Now stand there roughly where you are. Come, go forward a little bit, and then, um, then, then we'll show the people 
what it is exactly that you do so well at Major than New Milky Bar Kid. So I guess it's up to you when you want. Oops, who's dropping things over there? Wait a minute, off we go. Floor manager and an auto queue operator were killed in the ensuing melee, and a bullet lodged in Holmes's brain. Close friends say he has never been the same. After the shooting, Milky's name was removed and replaced with Hudson and Halls. And tonight. <laughs> Got that wrong. Tonight we're going to do. The late, great gay gourmands were loved by all, and despite their gayness, they are now both in heaven. But it was a rocky road, as it was for our other famous gay icons, Chez and Dale. In the 1970s, Chez and Dale were the most popular entertainers in the country. But then, in 1978, Chez and Dale found themselves at the centre of a firestorm. In a misguided pitch to the growing Arab dairy market, the pair appeared in a series of commercials that featured Mahamaru, basically a kangaroo with the head of the prophet. It was meant to appeal to Arab customers, but backfired and ended up costing the dairy board millions. Chez and Dale were fired. Penniless, the pair spent most of the next day making adult films in Sydney's King's Cross, before a chance meeting with an up-and-coming director by the name of David Lynch. Today, it seems like any other second-rate hotel full of packaged tourists and travelling businessmen who intend to cheat on their wives. But in 1996, the Carlton was the scene of hysterical worship to rival the Hajj. There was the wave, the glasses, the hat, the smile. Classic Jackson that hundreds of fans turned out to see and they weren't disappointed. Fans crowding the pavement outside Auckland's Carlton Hotel went wild when the 34-year-old megastar emerged last night, just hours after jetting into Auckland by private plane. When Michael Jackson moonwalked into town, the locals went gaga. Even those who were already gaga. Pretty cool, sleeping on the, uh, over there on the bench and just waiting for Michael to either appear or even just look out the window <laughs> hopefully to see him this girl was deeply touched by jackson at his concert i'm the girl who got to slow dance with michael jackson i can't explain you know fully so people can understand how it felt because it was amazing beyond amazing even hardened journos were teary-eyed about meeting the great man indigenous and children i had two of his key um cool things but he's a nice guy we have a message for Māori children of New Zealand, the Indigenous children of New Zealand. We would love to visit them, tell them that. And our staunchest security guards were clearly moved by the albino negroid entertainer. Have you met him yet? We've met him, yeah. And, uh, and what did he say? You know. <laughs> But perhaps more shocking was the damage done to this native bush outside the hotel. Hotel gardens had been trampled during last night's rapturous welcome, but extra security staff are making sure that's as close as the fans get. A few years later, the world would learn that Michael Jackson indeed had no time for bush of any kind. Francis Bacon said that fame is like a river that beareth up things light and swollen and drowns things weighty and solid. He obviously never met Prince Tuiteka. Kia <laughs> 
Prince Tuiteka was the ultimate Maori entertainer par excellence. My impression of a pack of cards calling out in the desert. Oasis! <laughs> Dry one name. Tui married Missy in 1976 in the most glamorous wedding this country has ever seen. Afterwards, it was away on honeymoon in one of the prince's distinctive and choice limousines. Back in the 70s, when he was touring New Zealand, the name Prince Tui Teka always ran with car stories. If Elvis Presley could have a gold Cadillac, then it was good enough for Tui Teka to have his own special model. This one, specially fitted with carvings, and another one with a telephone and a television set inside. Teka grew up here in Ruatahuna, but he was also at home in the bright lights and night spots of Sydney. I think I'll take my cloak off because it's, it's too hot. Give me some takeoff music, come on. Sydney's Mandarin nightclub and centre stage is New Zealand's own outrageous, larger than life Prince Tui Teka. He can take off anything and send up most things, but always he's himself a Māori entertainer who can persuade even the most seasoned drinkers to put down their glasses and listen. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it! <laughs> That's enough take-off music. It's a hot night. Eating next to singing is one of Tui's favourite pastimes, and the battle to fit into the shirt at the next night's concert is a continuous struggle. After tea, it's a blast from the past. Hannibal Tekka in the home movies. The big elephant, and it couldn't stand on. It fell off. <laughs> it collapsed. <laughs> now they're putting him onto another elephant. And the elephant is leaning a bit. But I think he'll be all right. He's on. He's on now. And now the retard's there racing. And three, he's just about to <laughs> Fellow entertainer Sir Howard Morrison was no stranger to the fame game, and although he lacked the charm of Tekka, he achieved something few New Zealanders can boast. Hold on a minute. Who is there? Come and look. Howard once starred as a henchman sidekick on the American TV sensation Hawaii Five O. At the time, it was the biggest show in the world. Although many New Zealand rednecks couldn't understand why Cam Fong just didn't use his real name. Take a look at me. But you don't always have to be famous to achieve fame. Our most famous nobody was a woman whose claim to fame was her choice of slippers. Chloe of Wainui Amata went from zero to heroine when she featured in the television series Heartland. When you did the Heartland documentary, did you ever imagine that you were going to become so famous so quickly? No. It's just wonderful. I'm sorry, I'm getting all emotional. I'm just so happy. <laughs> People look so lovely to me. The gorgeous blonde solo mum became a household name and her sexy, squeaky, dulcet tones filled the nation's airwaves. We did quite warm to her because she was a benign consequence of welfare excess and uh, I'm too old to keep all my punches anymore. In an ideal society, she wouldn't exist. <laughs> but you'll doubtless edit that one out. <laughs> Even with a little bit of fame in one's life, there are still lonely, sad moments. I mean, we still have to do everyday things. Life goes on. We still have dishes to wash and housework to do. <laughs> She's almost like a modern Lynn of Tower in a way. But I think the thing about Chloe was she engendered a feeling of goodness in people. Um, wash our hair and clean out our ears. That's right. We still have to sh shave our legs and... You know, everyday things. I mean, life isn't all, you know, glitter all the time. I mean... Good on you, Chloe. Chloe proved true the old adage that one man's white trash is another man's white treasure. And she soon found herself immortalised in celluloid. 
Operation Chloe may not have won any awards, but it won the hearts of Chloe's mainly male fans. And it's still available at your local video store today. Good evening, Marcus. Chloe, how's your week been? Oh, it's been... But like a bleach blonde moth to the flame of fame, it began to fall apart for Chloe, and she was even forced out of her beloved Wainui Amata. What sort of a hard time have you been getting to make you leave Wainui Amata, Chloe? Well, um, certain people in my area, women I might add, not men, have undermined me as a mother. One for whom said to me just recently, um, a certain person and I don't exactly agree with your parenting skills, Chloe, which is funny because that certain person and this other person aren't the perfect mothers themselves. I mean, no person has the right to judge me or any other mother um, and, or undermine us unless they are the perfect parent themselves. I mean, it's not I don't easy. think that person exists, Chloe. But true fame in New Zealand comes to those who embody the twin attributes we prize above all others. Usefulness and sauciness. <laughs> Good evening. Well, although it was fine in most eastern districts today, it was cloudy in the west with persistent rain in Fiordland. And the Lynn was our most famous weather girl. A sex symbol who broke hearts and strained marriages. The anticyclone, which is now to the east of the country, is moving away. Her beauty and highly suggestive demeanour has been copied by more recent meteorological minxes. But the sheer sensuality of her broadcast still has the power to move one in most inappropriate ways. I'll see you again on Monday. Good night. We put them on a pedestal and then climb up a stepladder to shit on them. We love them and then bay for their blood. From the tip of the impoverished North Island to the scungy tea rooms in Bluff, we're a nation of big noting showboaters, of hobnobbing, name dropping star fuckers in this our Aotearoa, land of fame. Won't you come along with me? Ten, 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 ten,